Hey guys, Drifter here. Welcome to Black Ops 2 In Depth. In today's episode, we're talking about what makes you a good player. The gameplay that you see in the background is me playing with the Over 30 Clan in Ground War. We're just kind of having fun. I'm using some kind of sort of tryhard, kind of sort of goofing off classes, just having a good game, end up do having a good game, so I posted it. This particular In Depth episode is going to be a little bit different from the others, mostly because there's not going to be any textual cues. I usually have a lot of text in this one, but for this particular episode, I want you to listen to my voice and what I have to say and not just stare at the screen waiting for the numbers to pop up because there are no numbers in this one. This one is about what makes you a good player and to some respect what makes other people a good player. I wanted to say this entire commentary in the form of you, the English second person, but it's a little bit unnatural to speak that way and a little bit unnatural to write that way, so we're also going to be doing quite a bit of third person comparison. It makes sense because one of the things that you do to evaluate yourself is you compare yourself to others. Do I make as much money as others? Am I as strong as them? Am I as smart as them? Am I as successful as them? Do I get as many mates is them. This is something that we as humans do very, very often. And in Call of Duty in any sport, you want to see, am I scoring as many points as them? Am I killing as many people? Did I get as many baskets? Whatever. So we're also going to be doing third-person comparisons. This is going to be coming in from a statistical point of view, so we're going to be talking about a lot of numbers first, and then the subjective stuff afterward. The first thing that I wanted to say is that there is no guaranteed formula. There is no easy and fast way to say this person's definitely good and this person is definitely bad. There are three reasons for this. The number one reason is we don't know which stats are the most important and on top of that we don't even know how they correlate to each other or how they correlate to a theoretical goodness factor. If I were in graduate school I would have to build all these correlations and test them and prove them and that would be kind of a nightmare. We don't know what skill cap that other people are playing at. This is kind of like a sports team. You don't know necessarily because the matchmaking system isn't entirely public or at least not in Call of Duty. You don't know what skill level you're playing at. You don't know if you're in the top tier in the bottom tier or you're in the middle tier. You're playing against pro players all the time. Some people People might not have as good of stats as the other person, but they're playing up there in that upper echelon of 1% of players, and that's exactly why if they played down in a lower bracket, they would just dominate people. We also don't know whose fault it is when things go wrong. There are a lot of crazy, subjective, weird things that happen in Call of Duty, little mistakes, and sometimes the mistakes don't even affect the people that make them, they affect other players. That's kind of like, oh, your teammates didn't do this call out, your teammates didn't watch this hallway, and you suffer for it, and you die, and that negatively impacts your stats. That's why these stats by themselves don't 100 100% indicate a good player and there's no easy and fast way, but I am going to look at some stats individually and tell you the flaws with the methodology of judging a player by those stats and then some of the easier ways that you can use to reference those stats to see who is and is not a good player. The first thing is the kill-death ratio is not the end-all be-all stat. It's definitely a good one, but the things that kill-death kill ratio does not indicate, it doesn't indicate that they won the game. Not at all. They could lose a lot of their games, and you do see a lot of people have very high kill-death kill ratios and a terrible win-loss ratio. It doesn't indicate that they worked with the team at all. If they were a team player, usually the kill-death ratio guys, they're lone wolves, they're not team players, they just kill, 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 and then blame you when the objectives don't get taken care of, which leads me to point number three. Kill-death ratio does not indicate anything about objective play. If this were team deathmatch and you were only looking at team deathmatch, that would be very important. Even in team deathmatch, there is uh, you need coordination and teamwork and taking down equipment and score streaks and stuff like that. But no objective play is very, very bad. The next thing you'd say, oh, well, how about win-loss ratio? Again, win-loss ratio is a good one. I personally feel that win-loss ratio is better than kill-death ratio because win-loss ratio indicates that on average, your presence in a game either causes the team to win or lose more. So if you had a nice positive win-loss ratio, that would mean that over the course of several thousand games for whatever variety of random other factors are going on that your team won more often than they lost. And that would be a good indicator. But there are some things wrong with this. You could be carried by a good team. You can play with a very, very good team and they can carry you on their backs all the way to victory and you will have a wonderful win-loss ratio. Typically in a squad or a full party, there's usually one bad player or one player not as good as the others and he is being carried. He can have a role, he can have functions, he can do other things, but at the end of the day he's being carried and the win-loss ratio is not indicative of his particular skill. You could be playing against bad opponents. There are lots of people that lobby shop, they're looking for idiots, they're looking for low-level players, they're looking for split screeners, that sort of thing. Again, like the kill-death ratio, it doesn't show you what skill cap you're playing at, and to some degree win-loss ratio can indicate cheap tactics. This is unsportsmanlike, this is using the overpowered gun, this is using the broken perks and broken equipment or capping objectives through 
through walls and little things like that that haven't been patched yet. Some teams go very, very hard for the win, and they don't intend on winning in any sportsmanlike manner, and that doesn't necessarily indicate that they're a good player. The number three thing, this is the new one that was introduced for Black Ops 2. Again, it's a very good one, is score per minute. I don't think that it is flawless. It's a nice indicator. The problem with score per minute is that outside of modes like Team Deathmatch, even sometimes with Team Deathmatch, people just shoot equipment. You have people that are objective whoring. This happens a lot in Domination or Capture the Flag or uh, Kill Confirmed. A lot of people just dash after those tags and they don't let you get your tags and that jacks up their score per minute, but it doesn't indicate that they're a good player. That just indicates that they can steal tags. There are some game modes that give more score per minute than others, so if you look at the overall leaderboard, some people that play, I think it is, isn't it Hardcore Search and Destroy gives you the most points per kill, something like that. They could be the best at that particular game mode and it just naturally gives more points than others. And some roles for certain modes and scores per minute just don't give the same amount of points. Somebody that plays objective really, really hard in domination versus the guy that's probably defending or necessarily being the slayer on the team might not get as many points. And that doesn't mean that they're a bad player or that they're playing the game wrong. That just doesn't indicate that they got as many points. Again, combined, these are good indicators. We're going to talk about the good things of using these indicators later, but I've got two more to touch on. Next one is accuracy. There are some players that judge others based on their accuracy. If you're very accurate, is that a good thing? I will say definitely if you're accurate, that is a good thing, but it depends on what kind of gun is being used. The pro players are naturally very accurate. If you are particularly accurate with only one gun, this is going to be a weakness. That means you can't use other guns, but if you are accurate across a variety of guns, this is a strong indicator, but some guns are naturally more accurate than other. If you only use the M27 and maybe something like the Chicom, they're extremely accurate guns, but they don't do very much damage. That doesn't indicate how many people are going to be killed with the being uh, going to be able to kill with those low damage bullets. And lastly, some people also judge others based on the type of gun that they use. This was more common in the original Black Ops and in Modern Warfare 3, but they'll look and will say in this game, oh man, you only use AN-94 and MSMC? You must be a tryhard or you must be really good to use all these pro guns or something like that. It doesn't really indicate anything what most gun you use. It can sometimes show tryhards if they only use one particular gun, or it'll show you what gun they're going to be using in that game, but that's about it. Combined, these stats can indicate how a person plays, but no one stat stands out. There's no one big factor, unlike kind of for human beings, one of the big factors for success is intelligence. Intelligence predicts 30% of success, and I know 30% sounds like a small number, but of all the millions of factors in life, that is a huge, huge indicator. There's no big 30% indicator here in the game. There's lots and lots and lots of little stats, and most importantly, how they correlate with each other. So I'm going to say there are two classes of players, and uh, these, these are positive classes and what you're looking for is above average stats. If a person has a 20% higher than average kill death ratio, win loss ratio, and score per minute, I will say that they are probably a good player. That means that across all games, they get 25% higher than average, and average is one for these first two, kill death ratio. They kill more people than get killed by, they win more games than they lose, and their score per minute is higher than the average, but you have to judge that for the particular game mode. These are good players, they're playing slightly above the average, but these aren't really amazing players. Where the really amazing players start showing up is where we're getting several standard deviations above the average, we're getting way down that bell curve, and if you see somebody that has a two kill death ratio, a two win loss ratio, ratio and a score per minute approximately double for the game mode, that's a monster. That's a dangerous person. That's essentially as good as two normal players combined. They're very, very dangerous. This, we're just talking basic math. The further you get out, the higher these two. But these are the three big stats, and the more you scale these up above one or normal, the better. But that, how would you check for a good player that has low stats and goofs off a lot? I would consider myself one of these people. So I'm kind of thinking, oh, you, Drifter, I'm comparing to for myself here. What you want to do, this is a nice little trick, you check the kill-death ratio of the top three to four guns. You would look to see what their top weapons are and what their kill-death ratios are. If they have low kill-death ratios or bad kill-death ratios with their top weapons, that's probably a bad player unless it's something obviously like crossbow or troll or something like that. But usually you'll see more common a 94 MSMC, MP7, if they have good kill-death ratio with those guns, but then lots and lots and lots of other guns used, that indicates 
indicates a strong player that can use some things very well but likes to experiment with other weapons. So if you do see that, be aware. And there are some non-statistical characteristics of very strong players. These are some things that can make you a good player. Number one is the desire to win. This is a big thing. Some people think games aren't made to win. Games are made to win, but they're made to win honorably. You want to win against an even enemy. You want to win without using cheap tactics. You want to win like a gentleman, like knights in a duel, something like that. You don't want to win like a douchebag. You want to win in a sportsmanlike manner, and the desire to do this, especially in the sportsmanlike manner, does indicate a strong player. Trying to work with a team and not instantly muting into anybody is another good indication of a strong player. What you see is some players, when they get a teammate they don't like, just mute, I ignore you, I'm not going to work, I'm going to do my own thing, and anything that goes wrong, that's your fault. This is not a team player. This is not somebody that has the ability to bend what they want to work with others, not somebody they can self-sacrifice. A good player will try. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. A good player will usually take one or two, like they'll just take a couple insults, they'll soak it up, they'll try to work, okay, well, you do whatever role you think you're best at, I'll pick up on my end, and we're not going to worry about it. Eventually, if the other person is too difficult to work with, you will just have to mute them and ignore them, but good players do try to work with whatever team they're given. Another thing, and this correlates with real life as well, is risk takers. People that take more risk always, in the very, very long run, get more reward. The reward they get is proportional to the risk, but kind of like with a stock market or an investment strategy, in most cases, as long as the risk is proportional to the reward, those that take more risk do on average perform better. This is a personal choice. I don't take as much risk as I probably should, even though even though I know the mathematics, I'm somewhat more of a conservative person. But players that really go for it, that really throw down in that clutch moment, that aren't afraid to run and go for this long tomahawk, that aren't afraid to try to snipe through the wall, that when they run out of ammo, you know what, screw this, I'm just going to scavenge somebody else's gun and whatever they've got, I'm going to work with it. Those are the kind of players that in the longest of long runs do perform stronger. And the number one indicator of a strong player, the number one indicator of a player that will be good eventually, maybe not now, is that they are always trying to get better. Good players, people that want to be good at this game or want to be good at anything really, they're always trying to get better. And I'm going to relate to you a personal story here. I actually used to play high school football and I was one of the strongest, biggest, most badass defensive players around. I was kind of the king of the defensive team and it was really great. But I let it get to my head, and I decided that I was good enough, and when it came to weightlifting, when it came to training, I didn't try very hard. I'm like, I'm the best. I don't need this. This isn't for me. Clearly, I'm the best. And I kept this attitude for way too long, and it got, okay, well, I'm second best now. And then, well, you know, I'm kind of average, and I just didn't really try to get any better, and because I didn't, other people got better, and they come, then they caught up with me, and then they surpassed me. And I ended up being crappy for a long time, and it was just too late. School was ending, and by the time I tried hard again, I couldn't quite catch up. If you're not always trying to get better, somebody else is, and they will catch up to you, and they will surpass you, so to be the best at anything, to truly be good at anything, you always have to try to get better. Even the pros that are at the top of their game, they wish they could get better, and they do try to get better, and that's what you need to do with this game, that's what you need to do in life, that's what you need to do with anything. That's all for this in-depth. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you learned something useful. If you'd like to check out my previous episode on Overkill, that is linked in over there on the left. The next episode, I don't even know what it's going to be on yet. There's going to be a box over there. I'm going to make that up when I get to it. And as always, if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.